Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you for uh, it's it's a it's a great honor for me to be here today at this uh, international conference with so many uh, migration scholars discussing this fascinating topic of uh, international migration. Um, um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, marriage migration in the UK. Uh, therefore, I will refer to the category of third country nationals who come um, uh, to the UK on spousal visa. Actually, I'm to, I will talk about uh, spa third country national spouses or civil partners who uh, come uh, to the UK on um, spousal or civil partner visa in order to join their uh, UK or uh, uh, Europe, uh, EU national uh, how, um, spouse or civil partner or a third country national or their third par party country national um, spouse or a, a partner. I will uh, look at this topic from a legal uh, perspective and I will try to investigate uh, the impact of the legal regulation of family reunification on reunited spouses with a special focus on uh, a gender perspective. First of all, uh, in, order to, in order to properly frame, uh, to properly address the topic of uh, my presentation, I should start uh, by explaining why family migration is a problematic issue in the UK, but actually across uh, many uh, European countries. And then why within family migration, marriage migration is a particularly problematic issue. Uh, Family migration is often framed as a problematic issue. First of all, because it is one of the major uh, source of permanent settlement in the host countries. Therefore, it can change the ethnic and cultural character of the state. Moreover, when it comes to family migration, often a big conflict can emerge uh, between, on the one hand, the right to autonomy in intimate relationships and, on the other hand, the public interest in immigration control. Thirdly, uh, although family reunification is a legitimate route to entry to the UK, according to a widespread belief, uh, this can be used abusively, especially within transcontinental marriages, who often are suspected of being marriages of convenience for uh, immigration purposes. Within family migration, marriage migration is particularly problematic. Uh, why? Uh, well, first of all, we should say that according to the statistics of the Home Office, uh, in Britain, the majority of family settlement is marriage related. And secondly, uh, marriage migration is particularly problematic because um, it's deemed to introduce archaic practices and asymmetrical gender relations into liberal society. We can think about very problematic and sensitive issues such as forced marriages, polygamy and gender-based violence, just to mention a few. Uh, we should, uh, I should also add, uh, and this is explain, um, partly explain why I am interested in a gender perspective, that marriage migration to Britain um, often concerns female migrants who join their husbands or uh, civil part male civil partners. Having said that, after this uh, short introduction, uh, what, what, what is happening is that uh, British policy makers have gradually established quite severe requirements concerning spousal family reunification and such uh, requirements uh, include limits related to, uh, just to mention a few, minimum age, 
minimum income threshold, housing standards and, and uh, language proficiency. Um, the result of uh, these legislative changes has been a progressive restriction of the possibilities of family life for migrants and ethnic minority. The, the, in the UK, concerns about um, family migration um, is not uh, something, it's not a new issue. On the contrary, concerns about transnational marriages uh, have a long-standing tradition within, within immigration control. Um, I cannot offer an extensive analysis of the legislative framework on family unification, but let me just focus on a few examples about recent legislative cha uh, changes which have occurred and which are useful, uh, in my view at least, uh, to address this issue from a gender sensitive perspective. In 2012, um, the family immigration rules amended the legislation on uh, um, family reunification on some key elements, uh, namely the probationary period for spouses or civil partners, income and language requirements. Uh, when I refer to the probationary period for couples, therefore for a sponsor who applied for, a fam for reuni family reunification and his or her united spouse or civil partner, I mean um, a period during which couples have to remain together to prove that they are not engaged in a sham marriage, in a marriage of convenience for immigration purposes, and during this period, reunited spouse cannot apply for settlement. Also, should be added that during the whole period, the no recourse to public funds rule applies, which means that reunited spouses must be financially supported by their partners or by working and they are not entitled to claim financial assistance. Therefore, they, don't, they cannot become a burden for the, tax, for the British taxpayer. Uh, in tw in um, 2012, uh, the uh, family immigration rules extended the length of the probationary period from two to five years before uh, the United Spouse can apply for settlement, and thus hence establishing more restrictive rules in case of marriage breakdown within, during the probationary period, except in particularly difficult circumstances, of course, such as domestic violence. I said that uh, family unification rules amended also the minimum income threshold a new minimum uh, threshold, a new income threshold to sponsor a third country national spouse or a partner was established. Uh, before July uh, 2012, the minimum uh, income threshold was of 5,500 5, pounds per year. And after July 2012, it increased to 18,600 pounds per year with incremental increases for uh, um, child dependents. Thirdly, uh, pre-entry and in 2012, pre-entry and post-entry language requirements for settlement were tightened. According to, to the Home Office, the aims of such stringent requirements are promoting the integration of spouses or civil partner, tackling forced marriages, preventing sham marriages for immigration purposes, reducing the burden on the taxpayer, and last but not least, protecting gender equality. Analyzing these legislative changes from uh, a gender equality, as, as I already said, marriage migration often concerns uh, female uh, migrants. It's interesting and it's useful also because 
if we think about women within, within the context of immigration, they are often seen uh, as, they are questionably seen as embodying cultural difference within the boundaries of uh, communities and those challenging the idea of nation and its borders. Marriage migration, as I already said, is often linked to archaic practices which are deemed to uh, oppress women. And uh, these archaic practices associated with some migrant communities are deemed to infringe a core value of the state legal system, such as gender equality. Well, looking at these issues, looking at the, these uh, tightened legisl legislative framework from a gender, a gender perspective, if we consider the gender implication of this greater restrictiveness in, in marriage migration, it seems that stringent requirements on marriage migration claim to act on behalf of migrant women to protect the gender equality and ensure integration. In fact, they risk weakening migrant women's rights and their chances of achieving an active citizenship citizenship status. Although based on real concern, the engagement of political actors in, in protecting uh, migrant women and promoting integration risks being a, a way of instrumentalizing gender in order to further restrict immigration policies. To understand, to, in order to understand what I'm saying, what I mean, um, we should bear in mind that uh, the legal regulation on family reunification have a very big impact in balancing or disembalancing power between uh, family members. And to give but one example about this, and to give but one example of the gender impact uh, that um, we, can, we can see uh, following these new the legislative uh, um, changes, we can think about the significant uh, extension of the probationary period to uh, five years uh, with no recourse for, to public funds. Of course, the extension of this probationary period delays the possibility for united spouses to get an independent permit of stay. Hence, it increases their legal dependency on the sponsor, the person who they joined in the UK. Moreover, the extension of the probationary period to five years negatively affects the possibility for the united spouse to support themselves financially, as often employers are put off uh, by uh, are put off by the increased uncertainty of the immigration status of these of, of the united spouses. Uh, limited entitlements during this period risk being then a barrier to social inclusion rather than support to integration as they in fact they disempower uh, united spouse and limit their ability to build a social network also some empirical research has shown that despite some provision provisions in the uk for migrant women on spousal visas who are victims victims of domestic violence many are unwilling to are willing or reluctant to leave the abuser if the partner control access to their legal status. The same negative impact, uh, if, we have, if, if we adopt a gender perspective, the same negative income can be expected from the new in minimum income threshold and from language requirements on women because it's, 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 uh, it's much harder to find women at the top of the labor migration hierarchy the labor migration hierarchy than men therefore women are mm, much less likely to earn 18600 pounds per year and therefore it will, they are less likely to be able to apply, to successfully apply for family reunification and therefore to act, to act as sponsors also if we look at the language requirements uh, Stricter language proficiency requirements who, have been who were established in 2012 uh, risk being a barrier rather than a support for integration and employment. 
This is evident if we consider that reunited spouses who are affected by the no recourse to public funds rule that I have already mentioned are excluded from free language classes. Therefore, they can only access paying language classes that sometimes are um, uh, are very expensive, and if we think about the situation of women, uh, uh, we should also pay attention to the impact of these stringent language requirements on uh, the specific situation of women who sometimes have low level of literacy, even if in their own language. To conclude, um, it seems that it seems to me that uh, marriage migration policies and the issues connected to this topic uh, suggest some consideration about the representation of an essentialized, vulnerable, vulnerable notion of migrant female spouse connected to forms of family life that are seen as patriarchal and oppressive and a barrier to integration. Uh, for example, uh, if, we, in, uh, with, if we think at immigration control measures, uh, they, they um, typically give migrant women rights only as victims and often only if they agree to take action against the perpetrator. Whereas uh, it is necessary to deal with uh, what seems to me this contradiction Acknowledging the complexity of this contradiction, on the one hand, protecting gender equality, acting on behalf in the name of gender equality, but on the other hand, in fact, the implementation of uh, immigration, family immigration rules risk to disempower migrant women. And uh, in order to disentangle, to, 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 to properly problematize this uh, contradiction, maybe we could start by uh, critically um, engaging with the construction of notion of uh, belonging within the new gendered British politics of migration and with, with its shifting boundaries. And I'm stop there. Thank you very much.